Welcome back to the channel, guys. It's been a minute, maybe more than a minute, but we're back. What are we back with? We're back with a series on microservices on AWS using ECS, Elastic Container Service, Service Connect. This is going to be a very in-depth video series covering exactly how to deploy microservices on AWS. We see on the left with a simple diagram, we have our user, we're gonna have our entry point being the application load balancer to our Elastic Container Services running on ECS because our ECS services are going to be in private subnets. So Travis is going to come to the application load balancer and it's going to go to our ECS services. The entry point for our microservices architecture is going to be service one, Elastic Container Service One. And it's going to access the routes from service two, simulating a microservices architecture. Okay, so before we get started though, real quick, you help to support the channel in a lot of ways. Patreon or GitHub sponsors, make a cash donation, helps me out a lot, really appreciate it. Subscribe to the channel, like always, liking and sharing the video, putting a comment below, helps with engagement, star the GitHub repo, and also follow me on GitHub. All right, with that being said, let's keep going. Microservices, what are they? If you're watching this video, I'm assuming you have a somewhat of an idea of what they are, but just to be crystal clear, because that's why I always try to do my videos, be crystal clear, let's just talk about it a little bit. There are small independent services, they communicate over well-defined APIs, and they're easier to scale and faster to develop as compared to a monolithic application. A monolithic application with 20 different functionalities built into it is much harder to deploy a new functionality to it because it may introduce breaking changes to the other 19 services because it's a monolithic architecture. They're all interconnected. Whereas if you have microservices, each service is its own say GitHub repo, for example, its own separately containerized application, say in Docker, for example. So you don't have to worry about cross-contamination. So if you push a code to one microservice and it breaks the microservice, great, the other 19 are unaffected rather than one change breaking the other 19. So that's a simplified example, but that's basically gonna show what microservices are and why they are sometimes the preferred approach. Now, how are we going to facilitate microservices on AWS? We're going to use a service called ECS, Elastic Container Service, Service Connect. This allows communication between the ECS services within ECS clusters. You can communicate between multiple clusters and even across VPCs. It's a very powerful tool that makes microservice development on AWS much more user-friendly. So a quick outline for the video series. To start off, we're going to get microservices running on our local machine, just using Docker Compose. It's gonna be a quick example, just showing how they interact, so we can get a feeling and get our feet wet a little bit before we start jumping into AWS. Next, we're just gonna create a working example on AWS. We're going to rely on a lot of the default values AWS gives us to create these microservices, mainly in the networking setup part. The purpose of the working example video is to give you something that works on AWS that you can see and touch and interact with. Too often, I have tutorials that are three hours long and are building the entire app from zero to a hero. These are great for a lot of people, but in my opinion, I'd much appreciate a simple working example to start with because I want to have something working as quick as I can and then I can expand on it myself. That's my preferred approach and that's the approach I'm going to be following in this video series. Right after that, we're going to create a production-ready example of microservices on AWS, specifically creating the networking components putting our ECS services and private subnets, having the application load balancer, et cetera. We'll see that in that video. Next, we're gonna use GitHub Actions to automate deployments to AWS ECS services. If we're gonna be production ready, we're probably using some kind of repository and version control. And if we're using those, something like GitHub, Bitbucket, et cetera, we wanna make use of their tools they provide us. One such tool is automated scripts we can run on push, pull requests, or even manually. And with those scripts, we can automate deployments of code. So once we have our ECS services deployed, then we can push changes to our apps automatically from GitHub without having to do any clicking on the AWS console. Much less error prone and much easier as well. And the final video we're gonna do is on AWS CDK, which stands for Cloud Development Kit. This is the most powerful video in the entire series, in my opinion. This video is where we're gonna cover how to use a built-in tool provided by AWS called Cloud Development Kit to write a script to automatically create 
and deploy all of the networking components and the ECS components as well, creating our entire microservices architecture by a simple deploy command. We don't have to go on the AWS console, click and create each individual thing. We'll have it all pre-specified in the script and just run it and then just create it. This is much more powerful than doing it manually. Biggest reason, standardization. If you have it standardized, it's easier to debug. It's easier to maintain. It's easier to deploy in an organization to multiple teams to ensure the teams are following the same architecture pattern. So again, this is the most powerful video in the series, in my opinion, and I highly recommend you watch it. The components we're going to be going through in this video series are right here. Now I'm going to take a step back real quick and say, if you're watching this right now, you see this list and you're saying, oh my gosh, this is too much. I don't know any of these. I'm done. I'm not watching this video series. Please don't give up. I promise you, if I saw this list six, seven years ago, when I barely knew anything about cloud development, I would say, oh my gosh, how can I possibly watch this? I will cover everything in excruciating detail to make sure you understand how they work, how they talk to the other services on AWS, and how they build up to microservices. I will not gloss over things, and you will find that each one of these services are actually very straightforward once you get an introduction to them, a little bit more hands-on, which I'm going to provide with the examples in this video series. So please do keep watching. Give it a shot. I promise that it will make sense. First component, virtual private cloud. Simple enough, it's an isolated environment on your AWS instance. It's somewhat like a firewall in network. You don't allow any kind of traffic into it unless it's pre-specified by yourself. You create public facing subnets that can access the internet. You create NAT gateways defined in the public subnets to route traffic to an internet gateway. You may not know what a NAT gateway and an internet gateway are right now, but once you see them actually created on AWS and how they interact, it will make a little more sense. And then that will be needed to pull the images from Docker Hub. And also in the virtual private cloud, we'll create private facing subnets. What are these? By private, I mean they can't be accessed by the outside internet. What are we gonna put in these private subnets? We're gonna put our ECS instances where the Flask apps are going to run. Why? Because we don't want direct access to the Flask apps. We want them to go through the application load balancer, which is going to forward traffic to those Flask apps. This is much more secure, and this is the production-ready approach that you should follow. Now, here's a quick example of the NAT and Internet Gateway. It's probably the most powerful visual I've seen online whenever I need to look this up or just researching or building these video series is this image right here. We see on the right, we have our private subnets. EC2 refers to EC2 instances. These are going to be the Fargate instances on ECS that we're going to be creating in the private subnet. And you see the routing to NAT gateways, which are in the public subnet. And then the NAT gateways route to the internet gateway. And that internet gateway connects to the internet. So you need the NAT gateways to be in the public in subnet because they need to be accessed by the internet because the incoming traffic has to go to the NAT gateway to then route to the EC2 instance. If the NAT gateway was in the private subnet, it could never receive traffic from the outside. That's why you put them in the public subnet. The internet gateway is basically just the gatekeeper right there at the edge of the VPC that allows incoming traffic in and routes to those NAT gateways. So you could have multiple NAT gateways behind, but you have a single internet gateway as an entry point to the entire VPC, virtual private cloud. The last container registry, this is where we're going to store our Docker images. I hope you're familiar with Docker at least a little bit. If you're not, it's okay. I'm going to provide you the scripts to run exactly as is, and you can read and learn them more as you watch the video series or as you download the code. But what we're going to use with Docker is to containerize our Flask applications to push them on AWS ECS so we can actually run them on ECS. We're going to push them to Elastic Container Registry as images, which we'll see later on the video series. Elastic Container Service, this is the big monster in the room. This is where we're going to use to create our clusters, task emissions, services. This is where we deploy and manage and scale containerized apps on AWS. We're going to be using Fargate specifically here. You have the option of EC2, but 
I'm not doing EC2, I'm doing Fargate because I'm not an infrastructure engineer. Fargate abstracts a lot of the infrastructure away from us, so we don't have to worry about the manual updates. We don't have to update the OS version. We don't have to worry about patches. They do it all for us. I'm a developer, and I'm gonna pick the developer-centric tool almost every time. So that's where we're gonna do Fargate in this video series. I mentioned ECS just earlier. We're gonna create clusters, services, and task definitions. That's the triage. Clusters are at the top. Within clusters, you create services, and within services, you attach task definitions. Task definitions are where we're gonna specify the CPU information, we're gonna specify the containers, the Docker containers, specify the ECR repository, where to pull those Docker images from, et cetera. The services are we're going to specify how many of those task instances do we wanna run? Because with the services, we can configure auto-scaling. Say something like Netflix, you're watching the Jake Paul, Mike Tyson fight. It starts buffering. What could have solved that? Something like ECS services and auto scaling. As more traffic is getting routed in, we do horizontal scaling, where we auto scale the instance when it receives too much traffic to auto create more task instances on ECS. When that happens, we get horizontal scaling, the pipe becomes bigger, we can allow more traffic in. And then finally, we have clusters, which are groupings of services and tasks. You specify the EC2 or Fargate launch type here at the cluster level. So that's the triage right there. Next, we have cloud map. This is something like a mesh. This is what allows the ECS services on AWS to communicate with each other. You pick a specific name for your cloud map instance called a namespace. You assign it to the services, and then all those services within that namespace are able to communicate with each other across VPCs, across clusters, et cetera. Very powerful tool. We also have the application load balancer. Remember on the previous graphic, we had the internet gateway taking traffic in? Well, the application load balancer is going to be that entry point. It's going to provide a DNS host name, which you can think of something like google.com. That's the DNS host name. You don't actually see the public IP of Google. You don't type that into your browser, you type google.com. It's going to give us our own DNS host name that we can resolve in the browser. That's what we're gonna to use to access our application once we're done with the production ready video. Now, real quick here, I don't go as far to create a Route 53 domain name. I don't do that. You can do that if you want. You can assign an actual DNS name that's not created by AWS automatically, but you create yourself to be much more descriptive and easier to share with your audience. I don't cover that here, but I do cover it in my Flask to ECS series on YouTube. I'll link it in the top, and you can watch that if you want to expand onto that later on. With the application load balancer, you can write rules to route the traffic depending on path, IP, et cetera. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the application load balancer to route traffic to our target groups, where the target groups are going to define the IPs of the Fargate instances running. So we're gonna have our Fargate instance running on ECS, it has a certain IP. That IP is going to be registered in the target group. And the application load balancer is going to take incoming traffic and send it to the target group and have that registered target receive the traffic, which is going to be our Fargate instance and return our route. Finally, we have AWS Cloud Development Kit, the most powerful tool I discovered right in this video series. You might be familiar with CloudFormation. CloudFormation is YAML scripts that allows you to automate deployments of components on AWS. What I found researching for this video, trying to write a CloudFormation script to deploy everything, was it's very deficient. It doesn't have good documentation. Even support couldn't give me what I was asking for. So I had to find a different method. I thought about Terraform, I thought about something else. I found Cloud Development Kit. The great thing about Cloud Development Kit is it lets you write all the components for AWS to create them in your own custom code, Java, Python, etc. This video series, we're gonna be using Python. So we're gonna use our Cloud Development Script to write our Python code to automatically create the networking components and also the ECS components on AWS. It's gonna be a very powerful video and I highly recommend you watch it. And we can also automatically delete the components as well once we're done, very powerful. Final thing I wanna show you is just a quick visual of what we're gonna be doing. We have our user, we have our AOB, we see our ECS clusters on the top. Service one and service two are going to be an ECS cluster one. 
Service 3 is going to be an ECS cluster 2. The reason I have the X down there is because we're not going to be creating an ECS Service 4. Service 1 and Service 2 is to demonstrate Service Connect microservice functionality in a single cluster. Service 3 is to demonstrate microservice connectivity across clusters. And you see on the far right, they all share the same namespace. So that's the intro video for this series. Stay tuned for the next few videos in the series. They're going to be very instructional. You're going to learn a lot, I promise. And I hope you do end up watching the entire video series because it will pay off a lot. All right. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more. And I'll see you in the next one.